take a minute. This meeting is being recorded. I'm going to get someone to help me with that because for some reason I've not been able to do it. So my ICT support, Ola, is going to help me with that. Okay. Okay. So whilst that is being done, whilst that's being done, I don't want I, I don't want to cause too much of a distraction with the ICT issue, but that's going to be sorted out. Don't worry. I've just in done a very, very brief introduction on who you all are. And I would like to give you all the opportunity yourselves to introduce yourselves. So I'll just start from my top left. Can I start with James at the top? Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? And then we can then take it to Wemi Sola Budu. In Kichi Obi and then Obi Asika, if we could take it that way. Sure, great to meet you. So, just just so I'm clear, are these are we all we are the panelists here, right? Yes. So only the panelists are up here. You will be seen in a minute. Don't worry. Um, I'm just I'm getting someone to support me with that. But we'll sort you out. We'll get you. We'll get someone to help sort you out with the with the video. But please go ahead and introduce yourself because we've got well, about 60 minutes only for this panel and thanks. hopefully we'll, we'll get some interventions from the audience as well. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, James Tovani um, and I'm head of sports at Pulse. Uh, so we, Pulse a media company, launched a sports division at the end of last year um, and we, we're putting a lot of... Uh, time and fast into, into building up our sports coverage, our sports team and our sports, um, you know, media agency um, arm as well. So, yes, yeah, so I lead that across Africa with Nigeria being our, our biggest uh, market at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, James. Can I please introduce Bimi Sola Abudu? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Beverly, for having me here. Um, my name is Bimi Sola Abudu. I'm the MBA Africa Vice President and Country Head of MBA Nigeria. We recently opened um, the Nigerian office in February of this year. We're very excited to finally, and I say for me as a huge basketball fan, I'm really excited about the opportunity Nigeria presents to us and the opportunity the MBA presents um, to Nigeria. We're very adamant and excited about growing the game of basketball in Nigeria, increasing the footprint of basketball and um, the NBA, making sure that more young girls and boys um, get the opportunity to be exposed to basketball. And part of doing that is making sure that we influence um, infrastructure development um, of basketball courts in Africa, making sure that um, NBA games and BAL games are accessible. But just all in all, I mean, the NBA being an amazing platform that brings together all elements of, um, of culture, and we look forward um, to doing that in Nigeria. So um, that will be my brief introduction of, awesome. of what awesome. it is that we intend to do here in Nigeria. Awesome. And you're most welcome and exciting to have the MBA here, that's for sure. Now, can I please bring on Ms. Nkechi Obi? Uh, hi, uh, Beverly. You know, I call you Amaka, but I think Please, everybody calls fine. you <laughs> call me what Beverly, you, want. <laughs> you know, most people don't know that Beverly is my cousin. Yes, you we're know, cousins. So, uh, <laughs> and um, it's really a pleasure to be here. One of the most enthusiastic persons I know <laughs> about sport is Amaka. You know, I'm a you former athlete. Your videos. Awesome. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, so we'll, uh, I'm a former athlete, sports administrator, sports management consultant. I've been in this business for 30 years and um, uh, more than 30 years actually in the business, but I've been a sports person all my life, played everything. And um, from when I was about five or six till now. And, uh, you know, I call myself a lifelong learner and a change management uh, advocate, particularly change in how sports is uh, perceived and how it can become 
a platform for social and economic uh, development, especially in Africa, where the passion for sport is so high, but the opportunities to experience sport the way it should be uh, uh, almost non-existent, except maybe in North Africa, maybe in South Africa. And so over the past 30 years, I have promoted private sector investment as a key component of sports development. And I actually see the private sector as the chief driver of how sports can develop as an industry. So I run, not only do I run my own company by day, I moonlight as the thematic lead of the sports industry thematic group of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, a completely voluntary position where we have um, enabled the development of a new national sports industry policy that targets a minimum of uh, $5 billion in investment over a 10 year period between now and 2032. And we believe that it should deliver the kind of benefits that probably see us an annual 2 trillion Naira industry in Nigeria and um, up to about 3 million jobs at the end of that 10 year duration. I'm very glad that people like Amaka worked on uh, aspects of this policy and we're eagerly looking forward to its approval over the next within the next couple of months so that um, we can get the level of in, um, investment we require into areas of sports that can deliver these benefits. So I'm very glad to be here over for this topic that um, touches on a key issue there to my heart. How do we commercialize sport? So that's just me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you for the expansive and detailed introduction. And again, you've taken us right into the heart of some of the topics we want to address that we'd already began to pick up in the previous session, which is what does it mean to bring in more investment into sport? It sounds easier said than done. You know, people say, oh, if people aren't watching, they're not going to put their money behind it. Um, you know, Bemi Sola has talked about getting more girls, women into the game of basketball because there's a bit too much focus on the men. What does it actually mean? I mean, commercialization of sports sounds like a fancy uh, uh, title, but let's break it down so the audience can relate. So all of us can be, because all of us are stakeholders. I think we don't necessarily have to wait for the private equities to show up. They tend to want to work with the raw material on the ground. They tend to want to see um, the, 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 the possibilities. They want to see um, that they can scale. So let me take this question back to Bemi Solai, that's all right. You know, the NBA has come into Africa. They've come into West Africa specifically, and you're, you're heading up this, um, this, this amazing um, initiative. What does it actually mean in real terms to commercialize the game of basketball? You know, because the, the lifeline of sports is funding. If you don't have funding behind sports, it just becomes a, a pet hobby, like Madam, my cousin would always say, it's just a hobby. And, you know, how do you actually commercialize the game, with whichever game it is that you, you, one would be interested in? Um, great question. And to your point, actually, the NBA um, came to the shores of Africa in 2010 and us just opening um, an office here in Nigeria. And when you talk about commercialization of sports, it's something that is already that's being done and being um, capitalized on other parts of the world. Sports is a huge industry everywhere. In Nigeria, for the most part, I mean, research will show you that when you speak to a lot of organizations, apart from those who have invested interest in sports, they tend to see it as almost like a line item or like CSR, because there's a lack of understanding the commercial benefits um, of sports. So there's the commercial benefits. And I also see it as an opportunity for economic development as well and nation building. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that through the lens of the MBA. For us, um, investing in Nigeria and coming to Nigeria, there are so many elements for us from a commercial perspective and literally in terms of giving back to the communities where we do business. So I will start with when I said nation building and economic development. If you look at what the MBA is doing last year, we launched the Basketball Africa League. And the Basketball Africa League is the NBA's league 
um, the playing league in Africa. And the amazing thing about the league is you have countries, different countries, um, you have teams from different countries at different points in different conferences. So let me take this season we currently have ongoing. We have the first leg in Dakar. The amazing thing about being there is it brings, it's just basketball in, in theory, but there's the commercial aspect of all the things it brings along, right? Apart from having fans you feel in, our, in the arena, you have the tourism element where a lot of people who have never visited Dakar are getting the opportunity to visit Dakar. We did the same thing in Cairo, right? So you look at the impact of that particular entity coming into different countries and what it's doing to boost and to bluster um, their economy. So you have that for the BAL. And I mean, hopefully by next year, we can have um, a BAL, um, what's it called? I'll say an, a leg of the conference here in Nigeria as well, hopefully. Um, but then you look at all the different avenues of what, and I'm using basketball as an example, the impact it has on developing the ecosystem, you have the basketball economy, you look at all the different elements and what that ends up doing is job creation. Because what you're doing is if you can impact the development of the ecosystem properly, you're creating jobs along the, um, the supply chain, right? Then you now take it a step further where we talk about for us, it's like talent development as well, where you have young kids. I mean, there's a movie that's coming out next, next month that I would highly recommend everybody should, should watch, but this is part of the opportunity of what basketball creates. It's a movie about um, Yanis and his brothers. And you look at what basketball does is giving young kids the opportunity to make something out of nothing, right? And for us at the NBA, yes, you have the talent development part. Where What does that do? You have a lot of these young kids in Nigeria who have left Nigeria who have made something of themselves and a lot of them are now giving back to their country and sort of like investing um, back in Nigeria. And for me, that's very exciting to see. So for us with the NBA, it's, and that's why I'm like, with sports, I'm specifically using our area is I look at the impact we're already having being in market. I look at the impact we're having, whether it's from an infrastructure development already. So it's for companies. And I love what, um, and Kechi said earlier that this is something that's going to be driven by the private sector first um, and the public sector will, fo will follow suit. And this is what has happened um, in other parts of Africa for us. And I believe um, Nigeria is not going to be any different where we drive this change within the basketball ecosystem. And I know that as time goes on, the public sector um, will fall in line when they see, and I, okay, maybe not fall in line is this word, will come along and buy into it. Why do I say that? Because the moment you start seeing the economic impact, you see the social economic impact as well. At that point, it becomes a no-brainer that this has an impact in, from an economic development part, but also from a nation building in terms of equipping our young kids with the skills they need, with life skills they need to be successful in the future. Does that answer your question? It, it totally does. It kind of gives a blueprint for where you know, basketball can actually go, where it can permeate. Now, I want to move to a big brother of mine, Obi Asika, you know, we know you as the founder of um, Africa Soft Power. You are a big believer in the power of harnessing, you know, harnessing us as a people um, in all these various areas, most especially in sports and entertainment. You've done a lot of work in these areas. Um, it would be great for you to share your, your experience, your vision for, you know, commercializing sports in Africa, building it out. How do you see that build out in the next five years? You know, looking at what Nkechiobi has shared and what Bemi Sola Abuja have also shared. Is this realistic? Can we do more? What, what are your thoughts? And also, please introduce yourself. I think I accidentally skipped you. Sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, great. First of all, good afternoon or good morning. And a pleasure to be here. And nice to meet all the panelists as well. Um, from my perspective, I mean, first of all, yeah, I mean, I, I was really happy to hear what Nkechi was saying. Nkechi is like our leader in the in in, in the in the community here. Um, I, I, one of the things I do is I'm on the board of Sport Nigeria, which is an SPV which she leads, which is also trying to impact the space. Um, and the sports space, I mean, I I think a lot. There's a lot to learn from our local industry. Something she, she was saying earlier today that I think what we've been able to do in the Afrobeats, in the, in the music talent space, and what we've been able to do with Nigerian soft power in terms of the way our pop culture, which I call Afrobeats culture, is globalizing, is something that everybody can tap into. But one thing I'm really, really happy about is to see um, 
Ms. Abudu here from the MBA, because one of the things I think that is really that we can really, really learn and a real gap that exists in this commercialization is how, how do we productivize our soft power, right? How do we, how do we turn, how do we enable Whiskey and Burner Boy to sell 10 million t-shirts and caps in Nigeria before we even get to West Africa, before we get to global, right? We have, I think Nigerian talents easily have a billion followers worldwide, right? Before we even talk about, and I'm just talking about the music, Nollywood, I haven't even talked about the football players, but the time you put it all together, we have, we have, we clearly have a global impact. We have this cultural impact. We also have places like our back, Africa and MBA Africa, enabling us to see how we can create that sort of hard power back backing for Nigerian soft power. Do you get what I'm saying? I do. I think we've lost Obi a bit, but I, I, I can relate what he's saying about, you know, how do we leverage on our soft power, soft power being the power of the collective? How do we convert that to to numbers how do we how do we monetize that like obi you're back okay brilliant you're back okay oh, i'm back okay nice one yeah sorry about that i'm in lagos i'm in lagos internet land um <laughs> so basically what i what i what i was basically trying to say is like i'm not, not even how can we leverage i think we have our soft power ready it's here it's real it's tangible what we're looking for is product commodities merchandise you know, that's what we need to do. We need to create the next stage of it, right? We have the attention in the, in the attention economy, we have the attention, but where's the product? What are we leaving these people with behind? And when you, when you translate that to the sports side of things, why is the Super Eagles brand not selling a hundred million pieces a year when we all know that we're fanatic about the Super Eagles, right? So we haven't deepened these things into where they really come from. And I think that's kind of like, it's almost like global. We have to, to go global, we need to go more local. We sort of need to go back into ourselves and bring out the essence and really push it out. And I think I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lagos NBA teams and this sort of thing are going to come up with in terms of their merch, their cross branding, the music, because these are the things, you know, if you don't have those touch points, if you go back to the 90s, the best marketed league in the history of sports is the NBA. The NBA and hip hop changed the way sports has been delivered to the world forever. And I see no reason why Afrobeats can't do the same thing for Nigerian sports. I love that. Powerful. Can I interject there? Yes, please yes, that interject. Will, that, interject. So, Obi, I will assure you that that's part of the plan because one of the great things that the NBA provides, it provides this platform where all the different elements of our culture, we intend to infuse that into what we do. So from art, from fashion, from music, because that's what the NBA is known for globally. It's, it's almost like the voice of the youth. And in terms of how we're positioning the brand here is to make this... Where, and I love the fact that you use that approach of it's a it's localization approach. This is a global brand, but in order for us to speak to the heart of Nigerians, there has to be a local element to that, which is us speaking the language of Nigerians to connect with Nigerians. And the fact that Nigerians, we tend to be purveyors of culture, we're going to leverage on that in terms of everything we do in Nigeria. Excellent. Now I'm going to, based on what you've both said and um, Ms. Nkichiubi as well, James, I have a question for you now. So we've seen Africa soft power. We've seen uh, the NBA now wants to really infuse our cultural aspects into just, you know, to make the game more popular. Me, um, um, Pulse is, you know, came on the scene a couple of years ago and has done really well in terms of permeating, capturing the culture. I mean, I follow Pulse entertainment before I realized there was Pulse Sports. What is Pulse doing to, you know, I, I, I understand they're in different countries now. We've got Pulse in Nigeria, I think Kenya, you're talking about expanding. What, how, how does that commercialization piece fit in with what Pulse is doing? And how important is Africa to Pulse? Because Africa must clearly be important to Pulse to, to want to spread out. Um, our cultures are different. So how, what, how are you going to infuse our cultures in all these different countries? Is there a vision to have a Pulse Africa or are you just looking at it from let's go to different countries in Africa rather than just have a, uh, an integrated Pulse Africa? So I just want to hear from you on 
your thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, um, thanks, thanks, Beverly, and thanks, uh, Bemisola and, and Obi as well. I thought it was really interesting to hear, hear you, you guys speak um, as well, and there's some interesting points I've come back to on that. In terms of Pulse, I mean, Pulse is an African business, like we don't operate, we don't have any revenues, we don't have any business footprint outside of, of Africa. We have investors that are international, but it's, it's our market is entirely focused on Africa, and we do have, you know, so we are a pan-African business, although um, a bit like Obi was mentioning, you know, we, we, we have this kind of local thing where, where we, we are, we try and operate as a kind of local business in each of our markets, so our businesses are, are tailored to the, to the local markets. Um, but in as far as our country focus goes, we're, we're an African business, like we're entirely focused on on African countries. So it's not really a question of, do we want to focus more on Africa? Like that is our business model. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And um, I think then, can you just, there's a few different questions there. You'll have to yeah, remind so, me. So like how is, you know, commercialization of sports is important. You know, we're big fanatics. We've, we've talked about that. Yeah. Um, Obi Asika mentioned, we're, we're a nation of speaking from a Nigerian perspective only. We are a football-loving nation to start, not to mention the other sports. But often the issue is we are unable to convert that fanaticism to 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 finance. Like, yeah, it's about the love of the game, but the truth of the matter is, there, there ain't no romance without finance. You need the um, finance. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you marry both? How do we monetize and leverage? Because ultimately, it's going to also trickle down and help Africans. Because it's not just about making money for the business. Employment. How are you employing? Um, you know, policies. How are you operating? I mean, just those are the sort of questions we're asking. Because people yeah. are looking up to all of you, the panelists, people might be in the audience thinking, I want to start a sports media company, but <laughs> I'm not sure how I'm going to make any money from that. Mm. I could just be doing it for the love of it. But is there really any opportunity in in sports? To be honest, that, that, I think I'll that's good. The the general point. I'll, I'll answer in the general and then I'll, I'll answer specifically with regards to Paul. So I think there's a couple of distinctions and nuances. One is that the need there's a distinction between watching sport and, and playing sport and you know what i think most people watching this or participating in this panel will, will know is that there's local sports in africa generally don't get much uh you know interest compared to international and that's you know that's something that we've seen is that we can you know we can put out content on the npfl on a variety of different local sports and this applies to varying extents to all our markets. And it's just not gonna have the same kind of um, network issues. Um, so I think there's an important distinction there. And when we talk about commercialization, you have you have kind of commercialization of the audience, of the, the viewership. And then you also have building up a national, um, you know, building up a kind of African sports industry. So you, you can have companies, I mean, DSTV might be an example of this, betting companies, I would say, are an example where, you know, betting companies are the one, they're the players that are really commercializing the space. Yeah. Um, and, and I would probably say drinks company, alcohol companies as well. That's not the way I would, those aren't necessarily the two that I would, as a keen sports player myself, I, I, I would prefer that it was, more diversified than that but the reality is those are probably the two sectors that are really making money from sports or maybe mm -hmm. broadcasting you know alcohol and, and, and betting and they're making money off people watching international sports mm -hmm. which is they're making money from that and, and yes they're employing people um so there is definitely benefits to that but it's quite different from saying we're going to build a league and we're going to have people participating we're going to you know make it so that nigerian athletes can make money out of their own talents so that they can gain sponsorships that we can build up academies that we can build up local brands i mean if for example a betting company making money it's not they may put small amounts of money into the local economy but it this there's, there's kind of two 
I see there being like two different ways of, of commercializing. And I think if there's not conscious, you know, deliberate thoughts about this, then what, what will happen, and particularly in football, I think is that there's this danger that the first happens without the second. And that you have a lot of people kind of commercializing the audience as opposed to necessarily building up the infrastructure in the country. Mm -hmm. I think what basketball is doing is probably they're doing it a lot more, I would say, in probably a smarter way from what I've seen, um, you know, a more culturally integrated way. And I think that was probably more likely to be successful in the long term um, and probably more and much more impactful in the long term as well. I don't see in any country really the same being done for football. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, I think there's also this difficulty when you compare to Afrobeats or, or Nollywood, which have obviously been very successful, is that with the sport like football, it's a bit more fungible in that you have a football league is kind of a football league. It's not like you have different genres of mm. football and someone can say, oh, I listen to, Af you know, I listen to Afrobeats as well as I listen to, uh, uh, you know, grind or, or dancehall um, in that, it's almost like a, a winner's take all, a winner takes all thing. You know, the, the Premier League, it, you can't really compare the, the quality of, say, the NPFL in terms of the quality of the pitches, the organization, the players, uh, you know, the, the quality of the matches, the quality of the broadcasting. It's very difficult. You can't compare that to the Premier League. I think mean, one has just got so, so much more resources. And I think if they try and compete on a living playing field, like, you're never going to be, it's going to be very difficult for that local league to get to compete on the same level as the Premier League because you're just never going to, you don't have the resources to get a better product if you could try and compete on the same metrics. So I think what's really important for us in building up the local leagues is that there is something unique about them. So whether it's, you know, it's not just trying to copy what's being done internationally, but there's actually like a, a grounded, you know, locally grounded kind of culturally significant um, uh, model there. So. It, that, that's just a couple of thoughts I had. I think you've raised more. a lot of food for thought, and it actually I want to segue that into um, Ms. Nkechiobi because you've you've very you've articulated it quite well. When we talk about commercialization of sports in Africa, we need to look at commercialization of the audience, which I know Ms. Nkechiobi talks about a lot. How do you make money from each person? It's not about, oh yes, I just have a league. How are we um, engaging Think all I need to do is just sell one player or two and I'm sorted for the year. And that's not very sustainable, right? Now, just to, to, to move this uh, needle to you, uh, Ms. Nkechiobi, what James has said about we need to look at commercialization from two left angles, from the audience and then from the business itself. What are we getting wrong? Let's start with um, the business. Maybe that might be more easy to identify. What are, what are, bus what are sports businesses getting wrong? What are they focusing on? They're focusing on the wrong things or they're focusing their, their lack of priorities. Do you just want to shed some light on that? Um, Amaka, thanks. So I listened to James. James hit the nail on the head. Dito uh, OB. I shared something this morning uh, from KPMG that said we just crossed the 500 uh, player mark for players coming playing in Europe leagues from Africa. 500, that's a disaster. That upends all the models, the, the academy model that everybody has been promoting as the road to success in developing the football ecosystem. Lagos State alone has over 700 academies. Nigeria has only 70 players playing in Europe. So clearly the academy model is not the way to go. In the, and to put that in perspective, let me, the, the nationwide league one, that's the third tier of the league system in Nigeria, it's not the NPFL, has 20,000 players. 
if by some stroke of luck I'm able to kill off the 70 people that are already playing in the league now, I can only replace them with 70 out of 20,000. What do I do with 19,930 players who are hoping to earn a living in this, in this space? What do we do with the more than 50,000 players in the Lagos State Academies who see their dream of playing in a league in Europe when right now there are only 70? So we need to have a conversation. It is obvious that the football ecosystem cannot be based on the number of players that are being churned out when you cannot provide an avenue for those players to earn a living. And to provide an avenue for them to earn a living means you must develop the product. I hear James that, you know, the, the, and I hear Obi, it is clear that we must finally deliver an experience for the passionate audience here that enables them to spend that money I keep ask, telling you that we want to take out of people's pockets. It is not, the, the ecosystem is not about players. And we've been singing this song for ages. It is not about players. I can always find 22 players to represent the Super Eagles. I can find in a nation of 200 million people. But I need to get 20,000 people into stadiums every week. The Nationwide League gets 8 million people into stadiums now, annually. COVID was a problem for us, but we were getting 8 million. But we were getting 8 million into stadia that you could not build a product out of. When you film those things, you can't tell. So infrastructure for us, and, and uh, Maka, you know, we, we, we finally zeroed in. The infrastructure is the key to unlocking the space. We do not have the infrastructure. I listened to Baby Sola. Where is the NBA going to play any? The NBA is going to play anything here. They have to bring in their basketball courts. So if the NBA wants to popularize basketball, it needs to do a backward integration into investment development. If we want people to watch, even if Obi carries all the Afrobeats musicians to test slim. The fact there's an eight lane or 10 lane track between the pitch and this thing, the whole uh, uh, ambience is lost. So we need football specific stadiums. So we need, to, we need to flip our pyramid. We need to begin to understand that we can't be looking across the ocean. We need to begin to understand what kind of product do we want to develop? What do we want to see on a Friday night? Who do we want to, where is the, the facility to get 10,000 people into a stadium on a Friday night and start their weekend with us? So we take that money that they have and enable our footballers who are in the academy to know that they can live in Nigeria and own a house, own a car, uh, uh, be superstars, because we have developed a product. South Africa doesn't export any players. They don't need to because the South African football economy sustains. So what have they done? This thing is not rocket science. And every time when I hear people say, what is me, what is me? I, I'm like, what is not you? You just got to look at what somebody did. I don't want to compete with the EPL, just like James has told us to. But what do I have that we, my 8 million people who already go to the stadium across 36 states, how can I elevate their experience. And I can only do that when I put investment in infrastructure that would deliver a product that I can film and distribute that content across uh, uh, different uh, um, um, uh, uh, communication channels and then monetize that content. So unless we think of it like that, unless we look at 500 players across Africa as a major disaster, and a turning point for this conversation, because this morning was a sobering thought. Only the North Africans have found a way to get around this. And so what are they doing? I saw the, the digital footprints of clubs across uh, uh, Africa. And the first, the top, I think the top 
20 or 30 came from North Africa before the first one came from South Africa. The first Nigerian came in at number 37 or 38, and it wasn't even any of the traditional clubs in the MPFL. It was a club that started two years ago, who's done everything right to engage. So we need to flip this pyramid. We need to look at what it would take to take 20,000 Naira every year from 60 million people first, Nigeria. What do I need to do to take that money from them? That money is there, they're spending it, but I want it, so what do I need to do? And the starting point is the inf kind of infrastructure that would encourage me to go to the stadium. Then the, the, the communication people the, will come in, and film that infrastructure and then put it and create the kind of product. People like Obi will bring his, his number one stars to the stadium because I can guarantee him 20,000 people will be in that stadium on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. So that's where, for me, infrastructure is key. If we don't get the infrastructure right, we have nothing. Yeah as a foundation and, and and once you get the infrastructure you can extract that uh, 20,000 you, you can extract the, the value end. chain you can extract yeah. the, value, the value, chain value chain from that okay so now i i would like to address some of those points you've raised directly to Bemi Sola, if that's okay because i almost feel like it's a bit of a challenge you know like what's it going to take to to address some of the issues raised by Ms. Inke Chiyobi and how will the MB, I mean, you don't have to give anything specific, but it's something to really think about, you know, popularizing it is one thing, extracting and, you know, uh, uh, getting that value chain stimulated is quite another. So I'd love to hear from you. No, great. Um, actually, I will give you exactly the blueprint of what the MB is doing to address everything okay. that James what James has mentioned and what in case, you know, that's why we opened the office in Nigeria. I mean, to be very honest with you, I mentioned one of the things um, uh, Ms. Nkechi mentioned, you talked about infrastructure and infrastructure is a big part of, of this, even for the NBA, in order for us to be able to bring global games. If I have to say we want to bring a Lakers to come to Nigeria to come and play, you have to have an arena where they can play that is of international standard. I will tell you this, there are two arenas being built at the moment. And one thing I want to say is that with the influx and the aggressive growth plan of the NBA um, on the continent, I can see the impact already. You take Rwanda, for example. Rwanda has an arena that, has, that they just recently um, built. The same thing has happened in Dakar. The same thing happened in, um, in Egypt. So we just came back from Cairo where we had the Nile conference. And all these arenas, why have they been built? They've been built because they see the plans of the NBA on the continent. So I see how we're going to have that influence. And I see it already because we have investors who are already investing in that in Nigeria. And I think to your point about, I mean, the capital is very important. And it's when you said things being private sector led, I'll go back to that. We're very fortunate to have two major investors. We have um, Tunde Falawio and we have Tokwe Lawani. And it's very important that you have individuals who have the, the means to be able to invest, to understand the vision for sports, to understand the potential sports have and are willing to invest in that. And the reason why the NBA can grow aggressively in market is because you have investors like that in place. So it's important for the other individuals who do that, who have the means to do that, are able to do that. So in Nigeria, we have not us building the infrastructures, but they are people in the private sector who are actively building arenas here. And when I said that, ideally by next year or the year after that, whether it's having the basketball without borders or having global games come here or having the BAL here, it's, it's, we can only play those by having those type of arenas that are being built. Then you mentioned a couple of things. I mean, the BAL, I mentioned the Basketball Africa League. Part of the reason why the NBA created the Basketball Africa League, because to your point, what we've been doing is you have a lot of players who are great basketball players live in Africa. The BAL is going to reverse the brain drain. I love the fact that I have a lot of international basketball players reaching out to me saying that I'm happy that I now have the opportunity to play at home in continent. So you have a lot of players that, to your point of not everyone, you have all these academies, not everyone can make it to maybe to the NBA or to the G League, but being able to create that pipeline 
that at every level, there's a place where you can play. So the MBA is very conscious about that. Then to address the issue of the academies, we have the MBA Academy in, in Dakar. There's one being built in South Africa. Part of my objective and part of my goal here is to get investors to make sure that we build an MBA Academy in Nigeria in the next two to three years. Why? Because if you look at all these academies in other parts of Africa, you want to know where half of those kids come from? They come from Nigeria, right? So part of it is by making sure that we create a robust talent pipeline from childhood. So even right now, I'm having conversations with the Ministry of Education to say that, how do we ensure that from a very young age, kids are being socialized to playing sports, right? Having conversations with real estate development companies by saying that, how do you ensure that you're going to build whatever structure it is you're building? How do we influence that to make sure that you're building basketball courts? So to make sure that a kid does not have to think and say, I want to play basketball, but I don't have a place to, to play. At the beginning of the year, we donated a court into a Korodu community randomly this past weekend. Randomly, I went there because I was just curious to see. We built this, we built um, this court. There are certain courts that were actively working on programming to make sure that these courts are being used, right? But it was very interesting to get there and to just see a bunch of kids in Ikorodu on the court with their coaches learning fundamental basketball skills. And all of this is possible because not only has the NBA put money into it, but to the, the fact is you also have investors, private investors who understand the value of sports. And we need to continue to make a case for basketball. For the NBA to come to Nigeria, it didn't happen overnight. It took people who did the work to make a case for it, for it to come there. And I know that as long as we continue to do that for other sports, it will get to that. Then two other things you mentioned about um, in terms of how do we, in terms of like, I think James had mentioned that when it comes to international sports, you have more people consuming international sports versus local content. Honestly, I've done a very significant analysis on this from being a sports fan before coming into this role. And a big part of it, I would say also is positioning. And it's one thing we're trying to do with the BAL. For you to fill arenas like you do in the US, you have superstars. People want to see their superstars. They want to be associated with that. We need to take our players and make our players superstars that people want to be associated with. When you do that, because if you just have a random person playing, and it's the truth, like when you have a random person playing, how many people are going to be drawn in there to come and see that? That's one. Number two, when we talk about basketball, for example, when it's all said and done, this is entertainment. It's an option to what I can do on Friday. It's entertainment. It has to be positioned as, su as such. It has to have the glitz and glamour of entertainment to it. If you don't, you're only going to attract your hardcore basketball fans. But for this to grow to become what like the NBA is in the U.S., it's because people are not just going there. When you go to the All-Star Game, for example, we had the All-Star Game in February. People are not just going there for basketball. They're going there for the halftime show. For all the celebrities, they know they're going to perform at the halftime show. They're going there for the ancillary events that are going to happen around it. So until we begin to position things that way, honestly, you're only going to attract a very small fraction of fans. So for the BAL, it's part of the key thing that we're doing right now that the first step for us was from last year to this year, get the product right. Get the product right by getting the right players and increasing the quality of basketball that was being played. So that's done. From a broadcasting, from a production perspective, we've increased that. So now the next thing is not, now how do you commercialize this product you've created? Because you can do all of that if you don't have that glitz. I mean, I have a background in luxury. And I know that at the end of the day, why does luxury sell? It's the way it's positioned. It's an aspirational product that people want to be associated with. If it's not positioned that way, honestly, it's just going to be people who love sports innately are the ones who want to be a part of it. But for us to make sure that it has that wider appeal, we have that numbers, that investors, apart from your investors, like let's say like a Tunde Falawiyo and Tope Lawani, that right off the bat, they see, they love sports, they see it. You want like your, your regular private equity company looking at sports in Nigeria as an opportunity because they see that we have the numbers. So we need to build the numbers. And part of this is we have to make this an entertainment option. If we don't, honestly, I don't really see that change in that. Whether it's from football, from basketball, you have people like your Obi Asika where making sure that when you have games, you bring the superstars there, right? Then with them, with the superstars performing there, we're also creating superstar players. We're talking about the movie coming out next week. I mean, next month with Yanis and his brothers. Why do people want to watch it? Because of Yanis' story is an amazing story, but Yanis and his brothers are superstars. That's why people want to see it. If it's just a regular player, maybe it might get some attention and people say, oh, that's a cool story. 
But the reason why we're all drawn to that story and we all think it's an amazing story because of their superstars. So I think there are so many elements, when you say commercialization of sports, there are so many layers to it. But in order to make this work, you have to tackle every single one of it for you to have a very successful, a very success, successful outcome. So many amazing points over there. I love what you said about even the players, the, the athletes are commodities. You know, it's not enough to just even have the infrastructure sometimes and just throw some players in. They are commodities themselves. And you have to be willing to put in the right amount of work, the packaging. A lot of lessons that we can learn from the entertainment industry are now being deployed into sports. Sports stars are now standing their ground as well. They are also equally stars. And perhaps that's one element that is missing so far, apart from the international um, stars who have come from Nigeria and became stars playing away. How do we develop homegrown sports stars? And this is where I come to Obiasika, the, the soft power guy. You know, you, 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 you know about the entertainment industry. You know what it takes to blend entertainment and sports. What, what, what do you feel is the next frontier now for, for the sports industry? You know, we wanna, we're seeing what the NBA is doing. We see their plans. We've got Pulse coming in. Then we've got, you know, talented experts like Miss Nkechi Obi. How can all this just come together into one amazing melting pot and give us the ecosystem that we want, that we need? People, people are bored in Nigeria. There's only weddings or uh, where else people go to clubs or they occupied with their kids we need to in, in, ingrain sports deeper perhaps so that that twenty thousand a year that Ms. Nkichi keeps talking about we can extract that twenty thousand a year as a sure banker i know that each household every year will surely buy a jersey or they will buy oh, tickets or, so i want to pass it over to you yeah i mean you know in case she knows my 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 opinion on this i'm a in the Nigerian context, I'm a bit of a radical in the sense that I believe that the first thing first is you start with education. So I think that sports should be compulsory in, in all schools, you know, five days a week, all the time, right? That's That to me is like the first and most important thing. Are you hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and okay. you're rather ambitious. I know five I'm ambitious. Five days a week, let's, let's start <laughs> with, with twice a week. I know, I know, I know. You know, you know me. I mean, you're asking me my opinion. That's that's literally my opinion. You need five, I need. I want to see five days a week. I want to see sports as not as a random thing, but as something that is you know that we all have to do every day. That's the first thing. The second thing is which um, Bimi Sola was just touching on. You've got to look at sports as entertainment. You've got to create experiences and products. You have to create brands. I mean, I'm not sure how many, how many Nigerians can name any players in our local football league. I'm not sure how many people own an any. I have I actually have an Enugu Rangers shirt, I am proud to say. But I can tell you that there are millions of fans that don't have one, have never seen one, right? Kano Pillars, every home game I see, I see their shirts. There are people wearing their shirts. But the truth of the matter is, everything is here, right? But it's disconnected. And it's, it's the way our country has been. It's like disconnected marketplaces, right? We need to stop thinking about sports like some sort of thinking out of rote, like it's some sort of um, academic exercise. Mm. Sports is emotion. Sports is real life. Sports is about entertainment and drama. If you watch any great commentator, what they're talking to you about in any game is about the drama of the game. That's what makes it massive. That's what makes you watch, right? So the great moments of sport are the most dramatic moments that you might, dramatic moments that everybody might see. And to a large extent, sports kind of replace the world wars as the ways in which the world competes. And that's what the Olympics does. And that's what sports does. So in Nigeria, where we have, I mean, I don't believe Nigeria is a sporting nation. I think we have the potential to be absolutely dominant in all sports, but we're not actually a sporting nation. In sporting nations, they play sports five days a week. They're, 20, they're 30 million people playing five a side, you know, football on a Saturday. It's not a, it's not a theoretical thing. If you get into a sporting nation like Australia or South Africa on this continent, they are playing sports. It's exactly what he was talking about earlier. You know, yeah, it's not just watching sports. It's not betting on sports. They're playing cricket. They're playing rugby. They're playing football. They're playing squash. They're, you know, they're playing, they're participating. And to do that is about building from the community up. That's the education piece of it. The commercial stuff with, with professional sports is about product and experience, right? But the beautiful thing that we have going for us, where we have the opportunity to sort of 
step into the gap and learn from the giants like the NBA Africa who are doing it the right way, then apply the things that are relevant to us, whether it's in the legacy soccer clubs and major brands we've had, people like Enugu Rangers, who frankly have a global brand, but are unexploited, right? And we have these kind of brands across a number of our sports spaces. So for me, it's about thinking out of the box and about actually zeroing in on creating products and experience. Because without the experience, you don't have anything to talk about. If we, if we don't have, if I don't have a memory of having had a great Sunday night football game in Lagos, what am I talking about? Exactly. I need to be able to go out and say, oh my God, did you see that player yesterday? <laughs> my God, one under 15 guy. You know, sports is about community. And, and I remember when I used to go and watch the 94 Eagles and the, I remember JJ Okocha's debut. I was in the stadium. There was no experience. We sat there for four hours in the sun waiting for the guys to come out. Oh there was no warm up. There was no nothing. And the experience has not changed 30 years later. Terrible. The experience Terrible. to watch my national team has not, in fact, it's probably gotten worse. Yeah. So it, until we do these basic things, you know, the, the Premier League was at the same level. 30 years ago, we're all at the same level. The league in Nigeria, the leading league in England, right? Arsenal was bought for 12 million pounds, 40% in 1982. You try to buy 12, 40% of Arsenal today, you know what the number is going to be. And it didn't happen just because Arsenal exists. It happened because they kept reinventing the league. They kept reinventing the thing. They kept inventing the experience, changing the way the football games were produced, changing the way it was communicated, changing the way it's reported. So you've got Pulse here. They're from the media side. Bimi is here from the league side. And Goz is here from policy. I'm more like entertainment and convergence. And really, these are the elements. If, you, if you've got these elements together and, and, a, and a government that understands the enabling environment in terms of tax waivers for big investors and things of this nature, then I think we're going in the right direction. But we've got to pick a couple of things. We have we have some advantages, football, basketball, boxing, track and field, right? We have some advantages. We have natural talent in certain spaces that we should actually just be pushing elite leagues in these spaces within our own country and West Africa and extending from there. Oh but God, I'll even catch you to talk about that. No, I, I actually just wanted to add to something that Obi said. Please do. Go ahead. So we're here. So as uh, you know, uh, listening to Obi, he concluded by saying, "So we've got media. James is there. So we've got uh, league. Baby Salah is there. So we've got the policy there. So we've got him entertainment there. You know, the only thing he didn't mention, and I, I, I wish I could share it here. I, it's not on my. I'm using my laptop, so I don't have that link." But I'll try and find it and send it to you, Amaka, and you can send okay. it out. I can send it out. Yeah. We do not have a midwife. You see, the private sector has always got it wrong. The private sector thinks they can do this thing working in silos. And we do not, you know, I call it a midwife. But if we go to America, they call it a lobby group. We have no one saying, I'm going to hold the public sector's hand and the private sector's hand, and we're going to walk through this process together, which is the reason we set up Spot Nigeria. And Obi knows that's the reason, because it was an identifiable gap. Someone who could interact with the government and get NBA Africa, I have to praise them. Some other people wouldn't put this kind of money in if we didn't know one. What are the incentives? How am I going to, what's the tax? What's the this? What's the that? I'm sure they're having to sort out those problems by themselves. That shouldn't be how it should be. There should be someone who is looking that there is a $50 million investment coming into this. And therefore, we're going to sit to the Ministry of Trade and Industry and say, you need to give us tax rebate for 20 years. Ah, we can't give you 20, we'll give you 10. You need to give us this, this, this. You need to give us an import duty. You need to do this. You need to do that. We don't want to pay for land. So you need to negotiate with the governor's forum since it is the governors that have land. And they should be able to provide one piece of land here. The biggest challenge, and I praise Bemi Salah and the MBA Africa, but they're going to come to a point where they're going to need that that because yeah. you cannot, we cannot scale up. We cannot scale up. Nigeria needs 5,000 community facilities. 
each costing a million dollars within the next 10 years. How are you going to scale it up? How are you going to get, we don't even have, look, a, a stadium to population ratio is one to five million. You, I, ideal is one to 300,000. South Africa is one to 700,000. When on earth are we even going to reach, if we don't have a way to scale up rapidly, and to scale up rapidly means there's somebody sitting down and, and negotiating on your behalf. That's where we haven't got it right in this country. We keep thinking it's about one private sector individual going to go and open one. So very nice and very wonderful. But we are 200 million people. When on earth are we ever going to get everybody to go? So if we did 5,000 community-based facilities, how are we going to get the MBA to build 10% of that? What is the MBA going to demand in return for that? Are we going to be able to give them what they demand in terms of incentives? What about capital to do that? The MBA doesn't have limitless uh, sources of funds. What about football? How are we going to do that? How do we get the money for football pitches? If we get basketball pitches, why can't we have football pitches? So there must be a sustainable way of scaling up these things. And that's why Sport Nigeria came in. So for the first time, we're actually going, doing like a proper backward integration of how to do change management in a sector. And I'm glad people like Obi, and incidentally, uh, Mr. Atunde Falaoyo is our chairman. So you see, he's very, very vested in seeing that sports flips that pyramid. You, you know, it's uncanny how this has happened. Someday we'll tell the story. When Nigeria launches, we'll tell the story of how he got into this space. But we're so glad. Some of the people on board Sport Nigeria, former ministers and all, who are interested in seeing that a sector like sports delivers on its premise. So, Obi, uh, James, uh, Bemisola, Beverly, Finally, we are going to that midwife that will make the various sectors come together and help us to negotiate all those intangible things that we take for granted, but are absolutely necessary for this commercialization program. Yeah. I'm glad to say we're finally here. That sounds that sounds very, very hopeful. And at this point, we have less than two minutes. So I'm going to start with James with closing commentaries. I mean, we've had so many comments. I can't really take all. I might just take the last two or three. So um, Henry, Dr. Henry Onokuba says um, the private sector, he says on point, Obi, let's go back to school sports. The private sector would come in if the value proposition is adequately articulated. Kebe Silva says, talking about infrastructure, would you say the fact that the country isn't developed is an effect on infrastructure? I mean, I would think so. Um, take, for instance, what happened at the game with Ghana and the players. And I mean, there's so many comments here. I, I can't really go through them all. But I think it's safe to say that one of the key things that have come out of this conversation is that lack of infrastructure. We need to create more products. We need to make the um, we need to make um, the, um, the the industry a lot a lot more attractive. We need to make whether it's in, we need to sort of drill down. Okay, if it's basketball, how are we adapting it to the culture to make it more interesting? And another thing, Wemi really alluded to is if you build it, they will come. But then Ms. Nkechiobi reminds us that it's very well and good to think about building everywhere, but remember there's a cost involved. And if we we have a huge deficit of about, uh, I think we currently have a ratio of one sta stadium to about 5 million people. In other jurisdictions, we're looking at one stadium to 700,000. So that deficit is huge. Who's going to pay for those costs? Um, I mean, so many, many fantastic comments, but I'm going to start with James. Your closing comments, please. Cool. Um... Thanks, Beverly. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of things to say um, in terms of closing thoughts. Um, I, it's hard to really sum up. I think what I would what I would like to see from you know individual 
what I would like to see more of is just, I think, coherent strategies from individual sports or, or you know, bodies as a whole. I mean, there are different ways you can go about doing it. There are different ways you can position yourself, um, you know, as sports or, or as a country. Um, and, you know, I think that could be well articulated, for example, with the music industry. I think within sports outside of, um, outside of potentially the NBA, NBA, L, but I, I haven't had any kind of sport or anybody really come and say, like, this is, you know, this is what our strategy is going to be. This is how we're, you know, this is how we're going to address it from different angles. This is how we're going to address the supply of talent, the infrastructure, the demand. There doesn't seem to be any kind of uh, coherent, um, you know, it's very difficult to find this kind of coherent strategies, I would say. And from an investment point of view, it's, it makes it difficult to, um, you know, to really, to really take seriously. I mean, if you look at something like the NPFL or, or really a whole range of sports or sports businesses here, you know, it's not clear what they're trying to do. How are they, how are they trying to find out? How are they trying to position it? Um, you know, what is the time frame for development? Um, how is it going to be unique to other sports? Are they, are they aiming for a domestic market or local market? How are they going to monetize it? All of these things which you would ask, normally ask of ever any business you invest in. Um, yes. That's the kind of thing that I would, you know, if I was investing in the space and, and you know, I may do, then that's what I would be looking for to really understand that strategy. Coherence and strategy. So I'm asking all the people in the audience, if you run businesses, do you have a strategy that's workable that can take you for the next 10 years? If not, you need to go back and look at it. Wemi Sola, 30 seconds, please. Your closing thoughts. <laughs> um, I think everybody has a role to play in this. As we, be, as we build NBA in Nigeria, I hope everyone supports what we're doing here in market. Um, I can assure you that with NBA in Nigeria, we intend to be that company that sets a pace and sort of to, that'll be referred to as the template of how things should be done. I mean, I think to James point, because of we're coming in as a league with football, you, you probably need something similar as well, right? So that it, it impacts the whole, it, it impacts the whole ecosystem when you have someone like the NBA come in. So I do really do hope that with the work we're doing here, everybody here, everyone in the audience and everyone who's a member of the panelists um, sort of comes along on this journey with us. And I would say for NBA Nigeria, it really comes down to, we want to make sure that more young boys and girls are playing basketball. We really want to use this as a platform for not just economic development for Nigeria, but also as a tool for nation building in Nigeria. And I'll stop there. I love that. A tool for economic development and nation building and all hands up need to be on deck. Obi Asika, your closing comments. Um, my closing comments would basically be that uh, sports is one of our true superpowers and we need to step up, understand that, embrace it and actually engage it. Um, what James was talking about, about the coherent strategy, I was listening to him and I sent a private message to Nkechi that please she should share to James the Nigerian sport policy document that she developed over the last several years, which is by far the most coherent thing I've read anywhere about what a country really should be doing. So from my, from my viewpoint, it's about, it's about collaboration and convergence. Sports and entertainment hold the keys to unlock the youth of Africa. I love that. I love that. And last but definitely not the least, Ms. Nkichi Upi. Um, um, Amaka um, and everyone else, you know, it, it, for me, this has been a lifelong journey and it's all beginning to come together. Um, James, there is some coherence thought that's been worked on, particularly for Nigeria, but it also can be translated. We took what we had before and put a sports, a sports industry policy. For the first time, we actually made the distinction. That's an industry, so let's treat it as one. And identified every single area of the value chain and put steps, what the action plans should be, everything. And once that document is passed, but we didn't stop there, we put it in the medium term national development plan, just in case anything happened. So a lot of the initiatives that are coming out and you know, the fact that we have Mr. Falawi on board, Sport Nigeria is one of the initiatives that came out of that policy. The need for somebody to drive everybody, to push everybody to come to the table and talk. 
So maybe if you took a look at it, you would see what we had. But I'll ask everybody to go back there and then do what James asked. Set, you know, put a, a proper strategy. Forget about money. The money will come when your strategy is right. So put your strategy for leveraging the value chain of sports because when you contribute to it, you're going to make, you know, people, you're going to make money. Just follow the steps, get the strategy right. That's, you know, my contribution. And that's a fantastic place to leave that this fantastic and very insightful conversation. I want to say a massive thank you to each and every one of you, the organizations that are behind you. Um, you know, many people are looking up to you as the beacons in the sports industry. So James Torveni of Pulse, Memisola Abudu, and Ms. Nkechiobi, the women, you know, we're looking up to women who are leading in the sports industry. It's a tough industry to crack, and I, and I don't want to, to cry, oh, because we're women, but sometimes it can be, but, you know, you're making those strides, and, you know, I encourage you to keep making those strides. And of course, Obi Asika, you know, the, the soft power man, you believe so much in Africa and um, the power of the collective. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for your insightful thoughts, comments, uh, experiences, everything. And um, we're running a little late now. We're kind of five minutes behind schedule, but I want to invite those of you who are still staying on for the final session of today to log out and please move directly into the next and final session for today, which is exploring new terrain and opportunities in sports so you know we're still on that theme of we're looking for the opportunities but we need to be prepared to do what it takes to harness those opportunities so thank you so much to each and every one of you thank, thank you amaka for having thank us you. thank you for having bye. us bye bye